In our last lecture, we found ourselves in the 17th century with India holding the largest share of the world economy at the height of the Mughal Empire and European countries establishing dozens of trading settlements on India's coasts. The end of that lecture, however, foreshadowed the onset of British rule, where India's economy would shrink from 25% of world GDP to just 4%. And as we saw in week one, India is currently, once again, the fastest growing economy in the world, and many economists predict India will be one of the world's largest, if not the largest economy in the world, within a few decades, or at least before the end of the 21st century. What we haven't discussed is the in-between. How exactly did India go from being the world's largest economy to one of its poorest? And how did it get back to becoming the world's fastest growing economy again? Of course, this takes us to the time of British colonialism. There is, of course, an abundance of literature you can read to unravel this question. And we can guide you uh, further resources below. But I find one of the most uh, useful summaries comes from Goethe and Das, the author of a number of excellent books on India. The key question on our mind at this point is, did Great Britain impoverish India? And how or why did India miss the Industrial Revolution? Let's begin with the Mughal Empire of the 18th century. Das positions Mughal India as having a developed banking system, merchant capital, a financial surplus, a skilled artisan class, and large exports. However, it was behind Europe in terms of technology, institutions, and ideas. Whilst this wasn't the case 300 years earlier, in part because of the wealth of the Americas circulating in Europe, and also in part because of the ideas that had come from into Europe from the East, as well as Europe's fair share of scientific genius and technological breakthroughs. Without an agricultural or a scientific revolution, India's per capita productivity was actually lower than most of Europe. A paradox we'll return to in week four. India as a country may have been prosperous, but the average person, uh, by comparison to his or her 18th century European counterpart, was not. The British did not come to power overnight in India. They were one of many European powers, not to mention large Indian kingdoms. The two key breakthroughs for the British occurred in the years 1757 and 1764. From then on, the British power and influence in India grew and grew. It must also be remembered that while we say the British, we really mean the British East India Company a corporation with shareholders headquartered in London, arguably one of the world's first multinational corporations. The Seven Years' War, arguably the First World War, uh, with fighting going on in the Americas, in Europe, in Africa, even the Philippines, um, had brought tensions between the British and the French in Bengal, in northeast India. Uh, and uh, they were absolutely at breaking point, on opposite sides. Under Robert Clive's leadership, the British beat the Nawab, the ruler of Bengal, and his French allies in the Battle of Plassey in 1757. This effectively made the British number one power in this wealthy region of Bengal. Following a subsequent British victory in 1764 at the Battle of Buxar, the British East India Company gained the divanship, the Mughal-mandated rule, of, the, of, of a huge swathe of northern and eastern India, about one-eighth of the Indian subcontinent. The British now had the ability to tax the locals and enforce their own rule on Indian people directly. Consequently, this part of India, and in the 200 years that followed the rest of India, was increasingly governed for the interests of the British. Instead of shipping out gold and silver to buy Indian merchandise, the British could now raise local revenue through taxes and use this to buy local products. Capital that was previously leaving Britain to pay for its trade was now able to remain in Britain to help finance the early years of the Industrial Revolution. Now, we could visit a number of theories as to what may have happened 
Um, but the outcomes are clear. India was soon only exporting raw materials, putting weavers and artisans out of work, who previously had sold their textiles to the British, their fellow Indians, and many others. Britain, home of the Industrial Revolution, powered by Lancashire textile mills, became an exporter of textiles and an importer of raw cotton from India. Under these trading terms, India's wealth was drained and capital transferred to Britain. The British enacted a number of other policies that accelerated this progress of impoverishment of India. For example, India's famous railways uh, were made from steel bought from Britain. The finance for the railway expansion was guaranteed by the Indian taxpayer and the highest paying jobs in the Indian railways, plus the pensions associated with them on retirement, went to British employees. From a longer term perspective, railways are a great example of the benefits of not being an early adopter. The British invented them first and the technology soon arrived in America, which also had a huge railroad boom in the 1900s and, 18th, and 19th century. And then, of course, there is the British era Indian railway system. And all three of those railway networks, the British, the Americans and the Indians, aren't exactly the most advanced in the world right now. Uh, look at the people who came second. Uh, look at the French, the Spanish and their fast trains in Europe. And, of course, the bullet trains of Japan and China. India became poorer and poorer by comparison to its increasingly richer and richer colonial master. The most shocking consequence of the poverty and the uprooting of local institutions and practices were the famines, several of them claiming millions of lives and over the period of British rule, tens of millions, maybe 30 million Indians died as a result of these famines. The last one of which was the Great Bengal Famine of 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. Using data from Angus Madison and the World Bank, um, you can see that per capita growth, when you factor in population growth, from 1800 to 1950 in India was effectively zero. This captures the end of the colonial period, the time when India was now a very poor country by comparison to many other places in the world, not least Britain. Following independence from 1950 to 1980, Nehru's India did do slightly better, establishing the era of the License Raj following Soviet-inspired central economic planning, uh, which was the fashion at the time. However, India, from a low base, still only grew about 3.5% uh, and achieved per capita growth about 1.3%. Amazingly, this is known as the Hindu rate of growth by an economist here, although quite what it's got to do with religion, I don't know. Um, you can make another clear distinction in India's economic growth trajectory from 1981 to 1990, a decade of growth rate of 5.6%, at 3.5% per capita. And India at this time was making small steps to liberalize. But um, following the first Gulf War, and the oil price um, uh, uh, rocketing. Um, 1991 proved to be the real turning point for the Indian economy, as the country suffered a um, massive balance of payments crisis. Um, the liberalization that followed that in 1991 um, meant that for the next decade, um, in the 90s, India's growth started to, to really accelerate, and it grew up to 6.2% on average per year. Following a brief slowdown, growth is now back up over 7%. Uh, the target is 8% and even 10%, uh, which is what it was achieving uh, in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, most short, medium and long-term forecasts believe growth of 6 to 8% per annum is possible. That's equivalent to the Indian economy doubling every 10 years. India's central government, based in New Delhi, is responsible for the country's foreign direct investment rules. For example, whether foreign companies need local partners or what percentage of the shares of a company can be foreign owned. Sectors particularly successful at attracting foreign investment have included IT, telecommunications, real estate and automotive manufacturing. However, 
State governments are also very important at the local level. They can provide tax breaks or help with land acquisition or guarantee and even subsidise electricity costs, all in order to encourage foreign investment, which means jobs for local people and eventually revenues for the state government too. Therefore, certain parts of India are more open to international business uh, than others, uh, or they have become hubs of certain activities due to their respective state government's policies, uh, the availability of land or power, and of course the skills that are found in the local area. The ease of doing business in India varies greatly from state to state. Let's give a few examples. Prime Minister Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat for more than a decade. Gujarat has become famous for being investment friendly. In fact, in 2015, according to the Financial Times, Gujarat received more FDI than Shanghai region of China. Ford have invested a billion dollars in establishing a state-of-the-art car manufacturing plant near Ahmedabad. Next door is the Indian Tata Motors, which relocated its huge Tata Nano operation piece by piece on the back of 3,340 trucks from the other side of India following protests related to the land acquisition of their previous facility in Singur, West Bengal. Maharashtra, the state where Mumbai is situated, has recently hit the headlines for attracting iPhone assembler Foxconn to invest five to ten billion dollars in setting up manufacturing facilities. Maharashtra's second largest city, Pune, has long been considered the Oxford of the East due to the quality and quantity of its educational institutions. It's also now home to major international manufacturing operations, uh, like those of Mercedes-Benz and GE. GE's so-called brilliant factory brings together automation, 3D printing, and is designed to make all kinds of products for a range of industries, from aviation to rail. GE recently won a Government of India contract to build 1,000 locomotives for the Indian railways. In the south, Tamil Nadu has also become a major hub for manufacturing, with Ford and Daimler, BMW, Nissan, Hyundai and others, leading Chennai to be nicknamed the Detroit of the East. In Karnataka, where Bangalore is the state capital, huge investments have been made in IT and software, with almost every major US player, from IBM to Microsoft to Twitter, having development centres in the city. Telangana, India's newest state and home to Hyderabad, has also been very successful in attracting technology companies. The IT minister KT Ramarao recently hosted Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, who is setting up a 4,000 strong development centre there. Next door to Apple is Google's largest complex outside the United States, and nearby are Amazon and Microsoft R&D Centre, amongst others. I encourage you to watch the short speech KT Ramarao gave during Tim Cook's visit to see just how Indian states increasingly compete with each other in the ease of doing business to encourage foreign as well as domestic investment to their states.